finish a game of Flashpoint South China Sea, uh, designed by Harold Buchanan and published by GMT Games, which sent me this copy. Thank you so much. There are two versions of this game, or two options to play the game. You can play it two-player or solo. Each have their own rule book, so you don't have to read one and then read the other to play the solo rules. You can just pick up the book you want to play and play that version of the game. We picked up the two-player rules of play, my son and I, and got it to the table relatively quickly. Um, this is uh, not your traditional war game. It's more along the lines of a Twilight Struggle card-driven game. The cards have multiple uses. You're playing kind of a tug-of-war with the victory track, and you're playing kind of an area control and somewhat of a tug-of-war on the different uh, areas of the game where you're placing cubes, which represent influence, and they're somewhat abstract. It could be political, military. It's a geopolitical type game in that regard. Um, you're playing, there's two sides. There's the People's Republic of China. There's the United States of America. My son played China in this game, and I played the United States, and my son won two by two victory points. He, he ended up with two victory points. So kind of a, a tight game. Uh, in fact, it was, uh, it, was t it was straight on zero until we did the final uh, scoring of the game. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about gameplay, and then we can talk a little bit about the state of the board, which is this basically kind of how, uh, how it finished up. Uh, as far as uh, gameplay, let's start off with how you start the game. Uh, the victory point track, you're going to bid to see who plays China. China has a little bit of an advantage in this game, and you bid to see who's going to play China, and you bid uh, you know, cubes to see who's going to bid, and uh, whoever bids the highest gives the United States that many victory points. So if someone were to bid, let's say, four cubes to play China and that was the highest bid, then they um, then the United States would start off at four victory points. In this version, since neither one of us had played it before, we didn't really know would be good to bid on it. I play more games, so I I just said I set the victory point track at zero and gave my son China, which he's half Chinese, so that was appropriate, I thought. Um, and, uh, so this was a very close victory. If we would, I think the normal range of what you'd want to bid to give, uh, to, uh, for, for the Chinese advantage might be anywhere from, you know, two to four victory points. So, you know, I can consider that a, a moral victory, right? That I got within two, uh, if we'd, if we'd have done a bidding uh, mechanism, although my son said he would have bid one, and if I would have bid higher then he would have given me China, but, uh, that's after we played the game. Um, so uh, that's an interesting mechanism that you bid to see who takes China. China does have a built-in advantage. Again, haven't played this game a lot and mainly have just gone through the rules mostly. But um, a lot of the Chinese uh, advantage, at least from my uh, understanding of, of, of just limited play with this or limited experience, is in the islands. Because uh, one of the key things here is that the, the Chinese cubes or the Chinese uh, reclamation that goes on in the islands, they stay on after each round, whereas the uh, U.S., you know, uh, freedom to navigate or the, or the naval operations of them placing cubes on the islands, those get removed each turn. So that to me is is, is a big advantage because the Chinese can kind of invest in an area, it stays on there, and uh, where the United States has to go in and, and try to, re, you know, fight it out every turn. So, um, so this is kind of how it finished up. Um, at the end of the game, if you don't know much about the game, you're saying, well, this makes no sense to me. So let me go a little bit about gameplay and then we can talk about it. Each, uh, turn, you, you're going to play three turns or campaigns, they're called. You get, uh, each side gets six cards. Uh, again, I'm talking about the two player game. The, the solo play a game, my understanding is plays it very similar, but there's a solo deck that kind of drives some of the action. Um, and, and the, the AI or the opponent that you're playing against doesn't get a hand of cards. I think they just use the AI deck to determine where they're, where they're, what, what their actions are. But, um, as I said, you, each side will get six cards and this is the discard pile from the game. Uh, so you're going to have six cards in your hand. 
and whoever has the most victory points gets to decide who goes first. So if you do the normal game where you bid, uh, the United States is more, more than likely going to be able to decide who goes first, and then they can either go first or tell the Chinese to go first. If it's ever at zero at the beginning of a campaign, then the Chinese get to decide or the Chinese pl Chinese player gets to decide who goes first. On your turn, you're going to be able to uh, play. You'll play one of these cards, and then the other side gets to play a card, and you'll go back and forth until you're out of your six cards. So both sides have played their six cards, and then uh, there's some cleanup, and then you go to the next campaign, and you do that three times. And then at the end of the game, uh, you'll do a final scoring of the cards, and and I turn these over because when you score something, you kind of turn over the card as a reminder. I'll talk about I'll turn these back over and talk about that in a second. But um, so you you'll play your six cards and you'll rinse and repeat that for uh, three rounds or three campaigns. So the cards, which you have three types of cards, you have black, which are neutral, you have blue, which are U.S. friendly, and you have red, which are Chinese friendly, and so. Uh, what you can do on your turn is you can play these for one of three things. You can play it for the event. Let's pull out one of these here. You can play it for the event if you're that player. So uh, the Chinese player can play red cards for the event, and the United States player can play blue cards for their events, and you just follow what the event says. Uh, a lot of times, or, or sometimes, these events might increase the tension track, and the tension track starts off at low and can go all the way to critical, and that actually affects what you can do with operations. Operations, that's the second thing you can do with these cards. So the cards have events. They also have an ops value. If you've played a lot of CDGs uh, or card-driven games, you're going to know what ops values do. So this basically gives you a certain amount of points to spend on operations, to do things on the board. So what are the things that you can do on the board? Well, let's talk about the board a little bit first. United States has uh, both sides, China and United States, they have an available area where your cubes are, are available to be placed on the board and you have a reserve and you have to do stuff to get them from reserve to get to available. Both sides have that. What are you trying to do on the board? Well, there's five countries. Each of the countries have an economic and a diplomatic track. And what you're trying to do there is you're trying to place cubes on the economic track to have a, a more economic influence over that country or on the diplomatic track to have more diplomatic influence on that country. There's also these island chains in the middle here, and they are actually connected to countries as well. So that comes into play. But on the with respect to the islands, um, you're, the United States is trying to keep these islands clear of Chinese influence so that you can have free navigation of, of commerce and military and what have you. Chinese are trying to reclaim these islands and take control over it. And so that is those two types of cubes there. That's a separate special op. Um, so it basically it's a game of placing these cubes or placing these influence on one of those three areas, either diplomatic or economic in a country or, uh, or you know, in in the case of islands, you're just trying to either claim the islands for China or keep the keep the the sea lanes free for uh, the rest of the world. That's the United States' job in this case. And what's going to happen is that based on which where the cubes are at on a given turn, you're going to have these scoring opportunities that that come up. Each there's there's a scoring opportunity for each of the. I have no nails. There's a scoring opportunity for each one of the reason, regions here. And then uh, there's a separate scoring opportunity for economic and another scoring opportunity for um, for uh, the, the islands. So what you do with the scoring opportunity is for a country, you're basically just going to add up the cubes and whoever has the advantage gets that advantage. So here um, in Brunei, it is one to one. So... There's not going to be any scoring there. Here in Indonesia, it's four to two, so the blue player, in the United States, would get two uh, victory points in that case, and so they move it up on the victory point track. That's how the countries work. Now, the countries also, the ones that have island, that 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 gets added in as well. Also, if you have a lock, and I'll explain that in a second, but if you have a lock, that gets added in too. So it's basically the total cubes that are attached to a region versus the uh, one color versus the other, the difference gets victory points and the victory point track goes up. On economic track, you'll just go country by country. So in this case, uh, 
uh, the United States has one economic, Vietnam has zero, the United States would score Vietnam. In Malaysia, China would score Malaysia. Indonesia, United States would score Indonesia, and, and so around. And you get victory points per country versus economic. When it comes to the uh, the islands, if you play that scoring card, well, that's just going to be a matter of the total number of cubes uh, minus the other one for a maximum of four, I believe, in that case. So there's there's basically seven different scoring. There's the five uh, countries, then there's the economic per country, and then there is the um, islands. So that's how you win the game. Uh, is, is doing that scoring and there's ways to score it during the game with these cards and then there's doing there's a final scoring at the end of going through these cards in order so now um, now we're to back to operations so you can play a card for its event which puts cubes on the board or manipulates uh, the board state you can also play it for the ops and the different ops basically let you m move cubes around you can move cubes you can play this one can play uh, a, an influence cube if it's available in your spot to uh, on, in economic or diplomatic uh, d diplomatic. You can play it on in a country or you can move a cube from your reserve to available. Again, you're trying to get cubes available to play. You can place uh, a phone op and increase intentions. This is basically a U.S. action where they can place in these uh, island areas to increase their influence. Now, one key condition here is you can't do that if it's on critical. This tension track, if it's on critical, the US cannot do that. So again, this tension track increases by, like right here, this would increase in tension, and plus there's some uh, events that increase in tension, uh, that increase in tension, increase tension as well, easy for you to say. Um, and so that's going to limit what your ops are. Then you can also place one uh, CR, that's a Chinese reclamation, and that increases tension. But that really gets costly because if the tension is high, there it's going to cost them more to do it or they might not be able to do it at all. Now you say, well, that's a disadvantage for China. However, at, again, at the end of each campaign, all the phone ops come off, but the Chinese reclamations stay on. That's a huge advantage because once they've invested there, it's there, and that the only way that would be removed, and there might be some cards that handle it, but the only way they remove it is if they decided to pull that off when they wanted to make some more available. But why would you ever do that? Because once you get it on there, it's gonna it's gonna uh, potentially score for you in both uh, for countries or for the phone op scoring. Then you can also place one uh, uh, political warfare. And then you can resolve political warfare, and that doesn't cost any uh, action to resolve a political warfare. Now, what's political warfare? Well, political warfare is where you uh, uh, take a cube and you place it in the political warfare box, and then when you want to resolve political warfare, you're going to flip a card over that from here, flip it over like one. Okay, so one, I had one in political warfare. I'm, I'm able to ex successfully execute a political warfare action. If I'd have drawn a two or a three, I couldn't because it's all going to be based on do you score uh, uh, same or lower as what cubes you have in the political warfare. The political warfare cube would go to available, and then you um, and then you're able to lock a country. Like in this case, I did political warfare. I locked that country, and you can remove any of the opponent's cubes of either economic or diplomatic. In this case, when I locked that, they had like two cubes in diplomatic. I took those off, put those in available, but I was able to lock this down. What does that mean? Well, that cube actually helps me for scoring, but it also prevents them from putting anything more in that country. They will they would have to do political warfare to knock that out in order to... Uh, uh, be able to do stuff in that country again. So political warfare is is pretty powerful, but you have to invest in it to make sure you've got a good chance of, of, of succeeding on a card flip, and it's kind of risky. You don't know what cards uh, might come up in the deck. So, so that's operation cost. So you have event, you have operations. What are the things can you play these for? Well, you can also play these for if there's like a friendly... A uh, card. Let's say uh, it's China's turn, and there's a friendly card down that has, uh, and I have a symbol in my hand, like this military symbol. There's three symbols. There's um, military, uh, territorial, and uh, trade, which is like a dollar sign. I can play this card out of my hand uh, to activate this card, 
I have to match up the symbol and the card in the discard has to be a friendly card. So in this, in this case, China, I could play this and then I can activate either the event of that card or the scoring opportunity of that card. Uh, we didn't do that at all in this game. That's called mode, and we just didn't do it. I mean, it it it, it's, it has to be kind of a – it's very situational. The cards have to match up just right, but we just didn't do that very much. But uh, but that's how that works. It's it's a mode thing where basically, you know, you're playing uh, – you cannot play your, the event if it's not your color. So, like, if I'm Chinese player – I can only play red events. If I'm U.S., I can only play blue events. So if I was a U.S. player and I dump that card because I, I just dump it for the ops value or for the score value, I um, I want to get it out of my hand because I can't use the event. And then the Chinese player can swoop in and say, hey, I've got that symbol. I want to use that event. And they play this and they can use that event. Okay. So that's mode value. The third thing you can play the card for is is you can also I can play that and I can also use the scoring thing. These cards uh, have a little scoring indication on their lower uh, left corner, and that usually respond. It can be the economics, it could be the FOOP, or it could be a region or a country. And so when you play this, you score that country. So if I, like in this case here, if I'm the if I'm the United States player, I would play this in each, uh, this this card for the score value only. Play in Indonesia, and then we would score in Indonesia. In this case, I have two cubes. They have uh, I have four cubes. China has two. I would score two victory points, and I just move up on the track. And then Indonesia would um, get turned over, and so it could not be scored anymore for that campaign. So you can score each one of these scoring cards once during a campaign, and then at the end of the game, you'll just go through them in order and score them one last time. So um, so that that's the limitations on scoring, but that's how you get points during the game. So you're trying to create a board state by either having more economic or more diplomatic or more cubes in total in a country or trying to control these inner islands and then uh, then picking the right opportunity to play a scoring card to get up the victory track. And that's the game. So you have, you know, ops, you have mode, you have events, and you have scoring. So each of these cards can be played for one of four things. You'll pl After you've played your six card, that both sides have played their six cards, you're going to advance to the campaign uh, track down one more uh, turn. There's some cleanup, meaning that basically everybody, every country loses an economic uh, the tension track moves down one. All the faux ops of the United States go off, go back to available, and then um, you basically rinse and repeat, and you do that three times. So not a lot of complexity there, not a lot of rules there. Uh, uh, the interesting thing about this game is it's combining a lot of different uh, aspects. You've got a, a little bit of Twilight Struggle here with the the, the card-driven aspect and the multiple use of the cards. You've got some tug-of-war here on the victory point track. That's a little bit from t uh, Twilight Struggle as well and some other card-driven games. You've got an area control game out here. Um, you've got the scoring. Now, different from like Twilight Struggle or other card-driven games that, that have like a – or like 1989 – where the scoring cards are in your deck and you play them out of your deck. The scoring cards are always always out here. However, they are kind of in your deck because they're on these uh they're on the the event cards. These are all event cards. They're on the event cards. So, you've got like a variable or random determination of scoring based on what you have in your deck, but they're all uh, available out here. So, kind of an interesting play on how that works. Uh, political warfare is very interesting. It's almost like a little pressure luck type situation because if you don't invest enough in political warfare, you might draw a high card and it totally wastes you. You have an unsuccessful political warfare, totally wastes your attempt. However, if you get a successful political warfare, you've got uh, you you basically can lock out a country. You can remove what they have in that country, and and it's going to be very hard for them to put anything else in there. So like Vietnam right now was ripe for. If I did that early in the game, then I would, you know, I would be hoping to get a lot of, you know, Vietnam scoring cards and just start just piling up points there. Uh, of course, that didn't happen that way, but uh, I was able to score it once. I think after I was able to to lock it up. So, uh, so anyway, that's the game there. Uh, you've got you know player aids that have your ops card, op, ops cost, and you can tell what you can do and what the requirements are, or prerequisites, or what the tension level, how that might affect it. That is, uh, that's for each player. So that's a nice thing to have out to the side here. On the back is the sequence sequence of action that basically kind of tells you what the cleanup is. 
uh, that's the main thing you look at this for because otherwise it's just playing out your hand of six cards and then go again. So each game is going to be 18 cards. So not a lot of cards, not a lot of time. I think we played this in about um, a little bit over 30 minutes, maybe maybe just under 40. Uh, but that was with that was you know with going over the rules. My son hadn't played this before, so I was going over the rules for the first time and trying to understand. Uh, what was going on with that. Yeah, I might have made a few mistakes on the rules. Uh, this isn't meant to be a, a rules overview. Don't don't use this to, to understand the rules. You know, read the rules. They're not that long. You can pick that up. Oh, there's also this on the back too, if you need that as a nice little player reference. But um, that's just basically an overview. And we generally didn't have any, uh, I think there was like two times that we we're like, well, what do we do here? There's some little nuances with, you know, uh, if if you make it go to critical, if you play the event card that makes it go to critical, or if you play an event card when it's at critical, then you, you lose some availability. The availability goes over to reserve. Uh, there's some, some nuances there. Uh, I think we had a question, too, that if it's at critical, can you play a card that makes it go higher than critical? I can't remember how we resolved on that, but I think we we looked that up. If if Mr. Buchanan's watching this, he can put his, put his notes in the comments and clear it all up for us. And again, this isn't meant to be rules exhaustive. This is meant to be just mainly my initial thoughts after after a play with uh, uh, against my son, who beat me. Uh, now, if he would have, if I would have, we bit would have been normally, I would have won clearly. But uh, that's not the point of this. The point of this was to enjoy the game and understand what's going on. Interesting, nice little uh, push and play. My son's comments on it. He thought it, he was, it was interesting. You know, he's um, he thought it was. Uh, it started off kind of slow, but we were just trying to figure out what's going on. There's a little bit of, of learning curve of just kind of looking at that board and trying to figure out what am I doing and what can I do? And you're looking at your cards and trying to figure that out. After you've, after, by, by the time we were halfway through the second campaign, it's like, okay, we knew what we were doing and we were just, you know, moving and moving and grooving. Um, and this, this became very apparent. The Chinese reclamation just became kind of a power position because you, once you establish that it's there and that's hard to dislodge, and, and you, can, you can only hope to match it at some point. And then that's also going to affect, you know, the countries that it's tied to. So it becomes actually a bonus in that case. So anyway, that's what I have on this. Um, thought I'd share my thoughts. I did an unboxing. I'll post that in the uh, description down below. But um, there you have it. That is Flashpoint South China Sea of after action report and a little bit of uh maybe a lot of gameplay explanation if i butchered that on that uh mea culpa sorry apologize for that uh mr buchanan please forgive me and and correct me on anything i said in uh to the contrary anyway uh like it my son liked it we'll we'll, we'll break this out again i do want to break out the solo rules which my understanding is it's not that different from the two-player game but you just got to learn how to use the solo deck which kind of has like a, a priority or, or how things get played out here. doesn't look that complicated. I play a lot of solo games, and I also appreciate games that have kind of a built-in solo engine, not some not something where it's like a, a tack-on of solo rules. This one looks like it's thoughtful in that it has a solo game that really addresses what the other side does, and, and um, it's not just a, a kind of an add-on at the last minute. Anyway, that's my thoughts on the two-player game. We like it. We think it plays nice, uh, plays fine. It plays fast. Once you once you understand what's going on, I mean, if we were to plop this down and re reset it up, which doesn't take too hard to set it up and do it again, I think we would probably smoke it out in about 25 minutes, possibly, because we really kind of know what's going on. I mean, there's some analysis of what you have in your hand and what the card play is, but that really doesn't take uh, uh, a lot of time. And once you understand what you're trying to do on the board with kind of the three different factors of economic, dip diplomatic, and the um, the islands, it becomes a lot. Well, you also have political will warfare, but I mean that just basically affects this side of the board. It it, it becomes a little bit more um, intuitive in that regard. Anyway, uh, like it, recommend it. Uh, I'm gonna play it again. My son and I will play it again. I'll even break this out with my girls. Uh, I think my, uh, my, especially my youngest might like this, uh, uh, aspect of the game. So, um, anyway, uh, thanks for stopping by. Uh, hopefully I didn't go on too long, but I hope this was helpful to you and gives you some, uh, feel for what is, uh, what's in this game and what it's about. Thanks all.
Thanks for watching.